Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, reminder to subscribe, share, and support, as my Portuguese-speaking Brazilian friends say, or support. That is, you may subscribe, whether you're listening to this on YouTube, Transistor, Google, Apple, or anywhere else. You may share the link to where you access to this with others. You may also share the very words of God that you hear read aloud or recited for you. And you may support by going to aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com for a newsletter on scripture and politics and language. And you may also go to patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. Today we are in John's Revelation chapter 2, or John's Uncovering, John's Apocalypse chapter 2, and we will begin with verses 1 to 7. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So you could tell I'm reading from the KJV today. As always, remember the functionality of the word angel. The word angel is messenger. In the G is right, I can use my own parish as an example, but we use this term based off of this book, the Apocalypse, the Revelation, the Uncovering, as a church administrator. So for example, my church, uh, the full title is Mount Zion, Virgin Mary's Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Cathedral. It's the seat of the Bishop of Southern California. It's based in South Central Los Angeles. And our church administrator is actually not the bishop, but a monk, uh, an Archmand Archmandrite, if you will, named uh, Abba Laikamaria normally, but his title is Malakas Ion. The word Malak is a cognate of the Hebrew, and Malak means angel or, more simply, messenger. So uh, Zion is a transliteration of Zion from the Hebrew with that nice Zada, that TS, uh, that's often transliterated into the Latin alphabet or into English. So the messenger of Zion or the angel of of Zion is the administrative position for the head monk who's uh, you know an administrative position of our parish. And here you see the basis of it in Revelation. The kind of representative of the church is called an angel or a messenger, and this is functional. Then you see that the Lord Jesus has this right hand. The right is always the power. And this number seven, without delving deep into numerology, seven is the number of completion. And so we can say that he has complete celestial power. And this is important because in these times, in this context, the celestial beings were thought of as gods. And so he has complete and total control and power over them. He gives the pluses and minuses of this Ephesian church or these Ephesians. And he says that they have great discernment regarding false teachings and thus false teachers, but that they need a little bit more love. This goes back to the classic debate 
Is it doctrine that matters or is it behavior? Is it theory or is it practice? And we see here that the good book and the good Lord, our good shepherd, relies on practice and behavior over theory and doctrine. Finally, it says, what does the Spirit say to you? And so this is an obvious saying, as we'll see throughout this chapter, that the Spirit of God, as it is written, has already spoken, has already said things to these churches. So these churches need to realign with that. We'll get into that more in verses 8 to 11. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So, as I said before, the Spirit speaks to you through Scripture. The words of the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the resurrected Lord Jesus, warns about the synagogue of Satan. One of my favorite secular music artists, although he's very influenced in a syncretistic way by uh, Judeo-Christianity and Islam, the, the three kind of main written uh, books and the people of the books. J. Electronica was accused for anti-Semitism earlier this year in 2020 for his album in which he referenced the synagogue of Satan and thus what are false Jews. Uh, and if there are false Jews and if there's a synagogue of Satan, obviously there's a synagogue of the Lord and there are authentic Jews. What people didn't understand is he was quoting Revelation. They thought that he's just you know speaking on his own whim or speaking as a foot soldier of the nation of Islam, uh, which is to say the kind of American uh, heterodox version of Islam in the black community that's that comes out of Harlem and, and New York City writ large, one of the many black nationalist groups. In any event, here the synagogue of Satan is a reference to inauthentic Judaism. Even within the texts of Judaism, when we examine the to Torah and the Tanakh writ large, that is to say, when we examine the book of Torah, which is the book of the law, the book of instruction, we find in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, and then again in the Nephavim or the prophets in the book of Jeremiah, a description of Jews who are uncircumcised in their lips and uncircumcised in their hearts. Uncircumcision in your lips, although you know it's supposed to be something for your private parts, in reference to lips, it is a figurative meaning saying that their speech is not aligned with speech that should be according to the Lord. And the heart in the primitive uh, views of anatomy of their time was the place in which thoughts reside. And so an uncircumcised heart is to say you have uncircumcised thoughts, thoughts that are misaligned, that are not aligned with the Lord. And so the authentic Jews have circumcised not only private parts, but circumcised lips and hearts, circumcised speech and circumcised thoughts that should manifest in circumcised deeds and circumcised actions. And so it is not a mark of anti-Semitism, but it is more uh, an understanding from the texts of Judaism themselves of who are the truest and most authentic Jews. Verses 12 to 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, 
even in those days wherein Antipas was faith, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitanes, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. The big kind of call here is do not fear death, do not fear imprisonment, especially when your death and imprisonment come as a result of you suffering for the sake of Hashem, for you suffering for the sake of my name, of the name, which is the presence of the Lord, the face of the Lord. And you see this rebuke comes from the two-edged sword or the double-edged sword, which is the word of the Lord read aloud, instructing harshly both the reader and the hearer, calling them to repentance and then granting them to receive from the hidden manna. I often say that the fantasy books and video games I read growing up kind of led me to understand the Bible more. And it's because people kind of always have this syncretism where they, uh, you know, they involve the various kind of uh, pagan mythologies with Judaism and they come up with their own, um, their own, you could say idolatries or their own kind of worldviews. But in any event, the Forgotten Realms books I read, the Diablo video game, the Baldur's Gate video game, the Champions of Norath, they all had mana as this blue magic potion that would uh, allow your character to cast more spells and have more power. But in the Bible, mana has a totally different meaning. Mana in the Hebrew is what is it? Mana is what the Israelites were fed in the wilderness, counterintuitively, not from the product of human hands through agriculture from the earth, but rather from no human work at all, only from the work of the Lord coming out of the heavens, that is to say, coming out of the sky to feed them and to raise their peculiarity. In the is right, the opening to the liturgy on all days, there's a there's a first opener that is different for Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays, one setting, Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, another setting, and the third setting on Sundays, and a fourth setting during the Paschal season. But right after that, the second opener, the second kind of main portion of the liturgy, which is sung and chanted and read, is the same throughout the year. And it, and it says, Anti wa'atu maswaba warq nis'u anta wasteta the main point to take away there is manna habu manna is manna habu is hidden so we speak of the hidden manna every time we gather for the liturgy because the ultimate hidden manna was not what was fed to the Israelites, but the fulfillment of that, which is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom we are invited to consume, differentiating our religion from the other religions. Instead of offering sacrifices to the gods, he offers himself to himself, and we participate in telling that story, and we live life according to the teachings that he gave us, that are not just about filling our head with theories, but living a life where we practice righteousness in our community and outside our community. Verses 18 to the end. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, 
I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give the power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be, broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The title, Son of God, is again here to emphasize the authority of our Lord Jesus and these words given to him, which are the very words of the Spirit. There is a huge commendation here. Oh, look how great your works are. Look how great your charity is. Look how great your service is. Look how great your faith is. Look how great your patience and your works are. And you know you're about to get cut down after somebody praises you that profusely. So following the commendation, you have a recommendation from a senior to a junior. And that is get rid of the Jezebel within you. This is an invitation to go and reread the book of first kings beginning in chapter 16 if you want to specifically see about jezebel beginning with chapter one if you want to see the larger context it also is a reminder of hosea and ezekiel uh hosea chapter one ezekiel chapter 16 or all of both of those texts will show you that adultery and idolatry are connected and that women are considered as communities and so this community needs to rid itself of seeking after other gods, seeking after other teachings, and needs to put at the forefront the practice of love. So they need to repent, they need to turn around, and they need to seek love at all times and in all places. Glory to God for all things.